we're going to bring up our next speaker, who is T. Binder Dollywell, and her uh, topic is Evaluation and Management of High Preoperative Corneal Astigmatism. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with you this, this afternoon. Thank you to Ed Holland and Kevin Miller for inviting me to participate. So we're going to bring it all together. We've heard some amazing talks on astigmatism, measuring it, uh, irregular astigmatism, instruments, how to do it. So I'd like to share with you some cases and we'll kind of pull it all together. Here are my financial disclosures. So case one, we have a 71-year-old attorney who comes in for cataract evaluation saying, you know what, my contact lenses are not helping me with my vision anymore. Best corrected vision with his contacts were 2070 and he could not see with his glasses, and here's why. Look at the difference between his wearing the old glasses and his manifest refraction. A huge shift in myopia and a lot more cylinder. So we do a slit lamp exam. Uh, the cornea looked clear with a thin slit. Uh, you can see that opalescent cataract that he had, which explains the rapid myopic shift. So as Tony Aldave mentioned, a great way to examine the cornea is with some fluor fluorescein and diffuse illumination with the cobalt blue light. And lo and behold, there was epithelial basement membrane dystrophy causing some irregular astigmatism. So he has about two and a quarter of uh, astigmatism in the right eye, axis 135. Who should... Who's ready to put in a toric lens at this point? Show of hands? Nah, nobody. All right, but remember to ask about contact lenses. Are they soft versus gas permeable? Because he's contact lens dependent, right? How long do they need to be out before proper biometry? Soft, two weeks is our rule, and soft toric or gas permeable contact lenses, three weeks. So we really want the cornea to be kind of in its uh, natural curvature before assessing for a toric lens. So when we have a, a toric IOL candidate, if we're considering that, we need to understand the patient's astigmatism. So is it corneal versus lenticular? So we look at the Ks, not the refraction. And then is it regular or irregular? And to do that, the best way is to do a topography or tomography. Now remember that only regular astigmatism can be fully corrected with glasses or a toric IOL, but an irregular astigmatism, that component can be fully neutralized only with an RGP contact lens. So here's his topography, and you can see that it's non-orthogonal. So remember when you look at a topography, it should look like kind of a figure of eight or a bow tie. In this case, this is asymmetric regular astigmatism, still a good candidate for a toric lens. In this case, if you draw a line in each pole of the, the steep areas, you see that they're not one line, and in, in fact, that's irregular astigmatism. So the next step is tomography, and indeed, there's some posterior elevation. So this patient really came in with a visually significant cataract, EBMD, and high astigmatism due to some keratoconus that he never knew about at age 71. But wait a minute, he wants to see without glasses, just like his uh, neighbor. So what do you do? Well, step one is to treat any ocular surface issue that could be contributing to astigmatism, whether it's regular or irregular. So EBMD, Salzman's nodules, pterygia, dryness. Step two, assess the astigmatism. Is it regular or irregular? If it's regular, this patient's a good toric IOL candidate. If it's irregular, ask the critical question if that patient wants to wear a contact lens, a rigid contact lens post-op. If they really love their contact lenses and want to wear them post-op, I typically avoid a toric lens. If, however, they just want to wear glasses, are not interested in a, in a contact lens post-op, then I would consider a toric lens with proper pre-op counseling. So what we did is we treated the EBMD preoperatively, and you can see his loosey-goosey epithelium here, uh, and we did PTK. We waited eight weeks, and indeed, 
we repeated the measurements. There was a, a large shift in the astigmatism and even the diopteric power of the lens. So after pre-op discussion with the patient then, he, he wanted a non-toric lens because he wanted to keep that option of the crisp vision with the RGP open. So the final result was that he wears his RGP lens part-time. He's actually really happy, and he says, you know, I never thought I could ever see this well in glasses. So his vision with glasses is 20-25. What do you do with those patients that have super steep Ks and keratoconus? How do you pick that IOL? This is kind of like made my life so, so much easier. When you have a patient with keratoconus, just look at their mean K. If it's less than 48, I use actual Ks, target minus one. If it's moderate keratoconus, mean K 48 through 55, I use actual Ks, target minus one and a half, and it's super steep, over 55, you actually use this average K of 43.25, and target minus 1.8 diopters. And we get pretty close. So it's um, been very, very nice. All right, let's uh, do one more case to wrap it all up. So this is my 67-year-old office manager with the cataract, and her chief complaint was, it's time to do my cataract surgery deep. So she already knew ahead of time, and she said, I'm going to need a toric lens. I said, okay, Judy, let me, just, let me just check things out. So we look at her manifest refraction, we look at her um, keratometry, her exam was pretty unremarkable, and she has high preoperative astigmatism. It all lines up, so we're good, it's all regular. The pentacam looks completely normal, just high regular astigmatism. So we did all the steps. Step one, we, there was nothing to treat. Step two, it was regular astigmatism, good toric IOL candidate and we went ahead and put the toric lens in. So in terms of intraoperative toric pearls, we measured twice, cut once, so we did repeat the measurements. And intraop, what I do is I don't mark that winged marker. What I do is I just indent it, and then I take a marking pen and let that fill in the gap. So in case the patient moves, I hate to have ink everywhere before I'm starting a, a toric IOL case. And so after we mark, sitting up at the slit lamp, intraoperative, we use those little kind of that indentation to help with the marking. And remember, per Warren Hill, the surgically induced astigmatism on average is not a half a diopter. That's the default in many formulas. It's actually 0.12. So the patient, luckily, my office manager, super happy after surgery, uncorrected vision, 2020, and she said she had never seen this well. So in summary, with high preoperative astigmatism, it can really be effectively managed during cataract surgery. Remember to understand the type, reg regular or irregular, and you really must do that topography and tomography. And here's the thing. Patients with irregular astigmatism can still benefit from a toric IOL as long as their expectations are realistic and they understand that only the regular component of the astigmatism will be corrected, just like vision and spectacles, and they're not motivated to wear that contact lens. Happiness equals reality minus expectations. Thanks for your attention, and uh, hope to have some astigmatism uh, sessions in Pittsburgh at our new Vision Institute opening 2022. Thank you very much. Dee, you made a comment that for RGPs, you keep them on three weeks. But I do. I, I've had patients who've been RGP wearers for, say, 30 years, mm -hmm. and it takes months for that cornea to become regular. I've seen a change in three and four diopters astigmatism. So I leave about a month and I bring them back and, and, and then I wait for the topography and the biometry to normalize, but it could take months. That's a great point. This is the minimum, okay. the absolute minimum, and of course we measure twice. So if the, the measurements are fluctuating and changing, we, we do not proceed. We measure twice, meaning they have two consistent measurements. Deepinder, what would you do for a patient who has six diopters of topographic um, bow tie astigmatism, very regular, highest lens implant that you can get is going to correct about four of that. That's another great question. And what I would do is put the highest toric lens in possible. I would let that patient heal and see what their vision is postoperatively. I would see, are they 
20 over happy or 20 over unhappy. And if it's a later case, then I have a lot of options that I can do at that point. And if they're really striving for spectacle independence, then we can do laser vision correction, we could do uh, um, some peripheral corneal relaxing incisions. But for me, I like to, to get the bulk done intraoperatively and then just see how they heal. Because like you said, there can be some surprises um, postoperatively as they heal. There could be a little tilt, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to just um, let them know that it may be a two-step process. But again, if they're 20 over happy, I'm happy. Your first case, you had talked about managing the epithelial basement membrane dystrophy before you proceeded with cataract surgery. After that superficial keratectomy is performed, um, what is your protocol in terms of how long you wait before you repeat the measurements and take them to surgery? I like to wait uh, typically between six to eight weeks. Uh, and, you know, we want their surface to be pristine, to be optimized, to be clear. So if they're, you know, healing irregularly or they're very dry after surgery, we'll just optimize until they get a nice pristine cornea. So at least six to eight weeks, and then, you know, you want to bring them back a few weeks later to make sure they're consistent measurements again. Sort of following um, Ed's question, would, and I don't know the answer to this, but maybe someone here does, I hope. Uh, with respect to scleral lenses, is there any guidance on how long patients have to be out of scleral lenses before surgery? Because theoretically, they shouldn't be touching the cornea. Anyone know that? I've, I've had, um, my, we have some amazing contact lens fitters in our area, and I've had um, them actually transition patients to soft lenses, and they, they will do that with, before even sending the patient to me for cataract surgery from a scleral. Now, now the patients will know that they're not going to get great vision. I mean, and they'll do it one eye at a time. Um, they've done that with RGP wares that where it's been like, you know, 70 years of RGP wear. And that's a great way to get, you know, this really comes up with the patients that are super myopic patients um, that can't, you know, really tolerate being out of a lens. Um, so uh, that's one, one thing you can do. But I, I, the sclerals are a little tricky because there are different fits to them. Some actually, you know, they do vault over, but the modern technology, they have, I, I can't claim to even fractionally understand <laughs> the, the scleral technology, but I treat them similar to an RGP. You know, John, uh, uh, in those patients I, I worry, because those are usually patients with severe ocular surface disease, yeah. and I'm having trouble getting consistent biometry and measurements in any of those patients anyway. So I guess I haven't thought to put a, a, a torque in those patients. Well, yeah. not a torque, just to get them to figure out, you know, even the, the spherical power on those patients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you know, the bottom line in all this is, is you just you do serial topography until it stops changing. Yeah. Yeah. I think the ocular surface disease scleral patient is a different patient, you know. I, I, that one, you know, they're going to be all over the place, I think, no matter what. Right. And then usually they're wearing the scleral lens post-operatively too. So honestly, it doesn't matter that much. Right. <laughs> I don't remember your exact equation, but the expectations minus results equals happiness or something. I like that because you know, with all these, we can go for the absolute best we can, but ultimately the patient expectation is going to set how hard and how long we're going to push them to get the best results. Obviously you want to do well, but sometimes if they don't mind wearing glasses afterwards, then you miss by a little bit or they fluctuate. It's not the end of the world. It's good to have those patients. Great. Thanks, DP. Thank you.